Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning to um, take our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, and set them up in a way from the things of this world and even our own selves and to set them upon you and your glorious Son. Help us to continue even now to set our affections on the things above, and one way that we can do that is by being under your word and let your word speak over our lives. And Lord, our desire, um, while you tarry, while you wait, we pray that we would wait well, and that we would see ourselves rightly under your grace, and that we would see ourselves rightly um, as a church family. Help us, Lord, draw near to us. Reveal more of yourself to us in Jesus, even through these words here as we study your Bible today. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, we're continuing on in Romans chapter 2. We'll be in verse 17 through 24 this morning. You can turn there if you want, but we're actually going to go to another passage before that. So if you want to get ready for that passage, it's Matthew 23. So we'll be in Romans 2, continuing on in our study in the book of Romans, but I want to back us up into Matthew 23 in, in just a moment. You'll remember where Paul left us at the end of Romans chapter 1. He left us peering over the edge, down into the abyss of God's wrath on mankind, and under and in that wrath pit... It's bad for mankind. Romans chapter 1, verse 32 says, And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. You see, mankind knows that those who practice the unrighteousness that's detailed in Romans chapter 1, mankind knows that he is worthy of the death sentence of God's wrath upon him. But they still do that unrighteousness, and they give hearty approval to others who practice the same things. They, they go on cheering each other on in what will actually devastate them at judgment. And then remember, Paul began in Romans chapter 2 with a, with a peculiar fellow. He's just like the mess of humanity at the bottom of the abyss of God's wrath, he, he practices the same unrighteousness. That's said twice in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, and in verse 3, and, and then he's called one who sins under law. I mean, his life choice is to be a sinner, to be a transgressor. That's what he wants to be. But when he looks on the rest of those around him, he's different than the rest because he doesn't approve of them and cheer them on in their unrighteousness. He judges them. Chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 3. And so we're learning more and more about this unidentified man that Paul brings up. We learn more and more about him, what's in his mind as a, as a hypocritical moralist. In verse 3 of Romans, his, his hope is that by judging the rest that he escapes judgment himself. He believes that he and God, are they're on the same side of, of seeing humanity's unrighteousness. They're in agreement. He and God think the same about them, and, and he even participates with God and judges them. And so he, he believes he's, he's in some kind of a position of favor with God to be able to do that. And therefore, if you're in a position of favor with God, you don't need to repent, so he thinks lightly of, of the need for repentance in Romans 2, 4, even though he's just as unrighteous in his practice as the rest around him. You see, there's a blindness in his eyes to his true condition before the judge. He's not any different than the rest of lost humanity, but he believes he's in a position of favor with God, which is evidenced by his taking up God's cause. He'll judge and evaluate others. Who is this guy? <laughs> a further hint to, of what is going on in his thinking is that all he believes he needs is just to add law to what he is. 
He, he's a sinner, but he, he just needs to put himself within the boundaries of law. And that's where he gets his moralism. But what we've seen so far in Romans 2 is that his possession of law hasn't made any impact on him at all. It helps him to judge others, though. And so in that sense, he's weaponized with law, pointing it towards others. And we're going to see that even more vividly today in Romans 2. And so an impartial God at judgment, Romans chapter 2, verse 11, who renders to each man what his deeds deserve, Romans 2, 6, that God, that judge will crush this man at judgment. Why? Because he has chosen to be an intentional sinner in all things, and adding law to that condition does nothing for him at judgment. Adding law in order to even unleash it on others does nothing for him at judgment. In fact, all it does is it just keeps heaping up wrath that he deserves because of his stubbornness and unrepentant heart. He is storing up wrath for himself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's Romans 2, 5. Who is this guy? We're finally told today. Romans 2, verse 17. If you bear the name Jew, it's, it's better to translate it in a middle sense. You name yourself a Jew. You've taken up the name of Jew for yourself. The context will show just how much he believes that name will do him good before the God of judgment. But before we dig into our passage in Romans 2, this is where I want you to be back with me in Matthew chapter 23. I want to take you back into the life and the ministry of Jesus for a moment because we need to understand who this Jew is that Paul is dealing with and he comes out of the seedbed of some place and Jesus dealt with these guys, these kinds of Jews. So Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, and I want to assure you this that if you transport yourself back into the context of what's going on in the Bible, no matter what setting it is, in this setting back to the Jews of Jesus' day and Paul's day, it will not shortcut the implications for your own life. It only makes it clearer what the implications are for your life. I know you may feel like there's like about 2,000 years difference between a Jewish man in the first century who's thinking wrongly and yourself. But I want to assure you that what's wrong with this man is not a Jewish problem. It's a human problem. And because he's a Jew and he happens to be human, he's got the problem. And because you're a human, you've got the same problem that he does, the same tendencies. Matthew 23, verse 1, Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and the Pharisees the religious leadership of Israel, they've seated themselves in the seat of Moses, in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds. Why? For they say and do not do. These religious leaders have taken up law. They're in the teacher's seat. But do they live it out personally? They don't. But boy, do they love to turn it on others. They're weaponized with this law. Look at verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. You carry this obligation. And they just watch them be crushed under the weight. And yet... Verse 4, they themselves are unwilling to move them with such a finger, even one finger. They wouldn't think to even touch that obligation themselves. You carry that load. I'm not needing to do that. Again, you see how they are weaponized with law to turn it on others with absolutely no impact on themselves. They are hypocrites. They are hypocritical moralists. They are Jewish 
hypocritical moralists. In verse 13, Jesus says hypocrites. Verse 15, he says hypocrites. Verse 23, he calls them hypocrites. Verse 25, he calls them hypocrites. Verse 27, he calls them hypocrites again and so forth. And, and notice the blindness they have. Verse 16, woe to you blind guides. Verse 19, you blind men. Verse 24, you blind guides. Verse 26, you blind Pharisee. One of the last people who should be guiding others, directing others, is a blind person. But that's Jesus' assessment of these Jewish hypocritical moralists. And drop down to verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. There's nothing but woe, deep, sharp grief and sadness and danger. Woe to you. Why? For you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. They look, they look good on the outside when they're sitting in the teacher's chair, reforming everybody else sitting at their feet. Verse 26, you blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. The only way to be clean outwardly is to start inwardly. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. The Jewish hypocritical moralist is truly blind to his own filth and danger within. And verse 28, the last one we'll look at, watch this. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy. You are full of lawlessness. Lawlessness. What a contradiction. Where are they sitting they're sitting in the chair of Moses, the one who gave the law. They're the ones reforming everyone else, but inwardly they are full of lawlessness. And this is not a Jewish problem. It's a human problem. Do you ever find yourself satisfied to appear better in the eyes of others all while you know that there's a different story going on inwardly? Why are you like that? Why am I like that? Is it because we're Jews? No, it's because we're human. Why is a Jew like that? It's not because of his Jewish DNA. It's because he's human, a fallen one like you and me. So these Jewish hypocritical moralists have added law to their lives, but it's made no difference on them. They're blind to the massive discrepancy between their inward reality and their outward religiosity. Americans can do this. There are such things as American hypocritical moralists. Mexicans can do this and Canadians can do this. Anybody can be a hypocritical moralist. It just so happens that the Jews had the first and probably best opportunity to perfect this and twist it. Let's go back to Romans chapter 2. That's the seedbed that these guys came out of, Romans 2. And this is exactly who Paul dealt with on his missionary journeys. He writes this letter to the Romans at the end of his third missionary journey. It's his third time across the Mediterranean world. These kinds of Jews ran not only the temple in Jerusalem, but they were also running the synagogues in the Gentile city, cities that Paul went to three different times on three different journeys. These kinds of Jewish hypocritical moralists, whenever Paul started to preach the gospel, these guys ran. They fled from his gospel. They fled into the refuge of their law. And in chapter 2, into the refuge of their circumcision, which we'll look at next week. When Paul preached to them faith alone in Messiah Jesus from Nazareth, when he preached to them repentance toward Messiah Jesus from Nazareth, these Jewish hypocritical moralists fled into the stronghold of their law and circumcision. They, they believed they didn't need repentance. We're okay. 
In verses 17 to 29 of Romans chapter 2, Paul chases them into their strongholds. And he takes away their false assurance of external possession of law and an external claim to circumcision. And he eradicates their possession, their external possession of law as a false assurance by proving that the law had no inward effect on them and they actually were dishonoring God with the way they lived. They were not on the same page with God at all. This man in Romans 2, he looks righteous on the outside, but inwardly he is full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Let me read verses 17 to 24 for you in Romans chapter 2. But if you bear the name Jew, and if you rely upon law, and if you boast in God, and if you know his will, and if you approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law, and if you are confident If you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you, therefore, you who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. What is this passage all about? Here it is. Two false assurances of the Jewish hypocritical moralist are eradicated. They're eradicated. Why? Because they have had no inward effect on him at all. This man practices the same unrighteousness as the rest of sinful humanity, but he's weaponized with law to turn it on anybody and everybody else. And he's completely missed himself with law. The first false assurance is this. Number one, the law of the Jewish hypocritical moralist. This is his stronghold he runs into, and this is the only one we'll cover today down through verse 24. Now, 17 to 24 breaks down into two parts here. There's an outward part and an inward part. Notice with me first the outward possession of law, the outward external possession of law in verses 17 to 20. Paul begins his argument with an if. Do you see that in verse 17? It's a condition. And Paul's willing to grant these ifs to this man if one of them is that he names himself a Jew, he calls himself a Jew, there's, there's other conditions here that um, Paul is willing to grant him as well. And what's the first thing on this self-styled Jew's mind? I name myself a Jew. Let's think, what makes me tick? What is the first if after that? He relies upon law. There is no definite article there. It should just say he relies, he depends on law. The point is, his version of Jewishness is one that simply adds law to his life. His unrighteousness in his lifestyle that we've seen over and over in chapter 2 just simply adds law to it. What he depends on is adding law to that rebellious life. He's weaponized with law, but he's not turning it on himself. Verse 17, if you boast in God. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? This is what makes him tick. I boast in God. Well, if you do, okay, grant you that. Sounds good. But our context will show how empty this boast is. It sounds like he wants to make a big deal about who God is, but the only one in his mind to make a big deal about is himself, as you'll see. In fact, God is actually not honored by him, not boasted in by him, but actually dishonored, verse 23. What else describes this version of Jewishness? Verse 18, if you know his will. This self-defined Jew, he, he knows what God wants, And he knows what God shuns, and he's ready to hold it over everybody else. What else makes his Jewish version tick? Verse 18, if you approve the things that are essential. 
That means he's tested them. He's tested what the basic foundational things are in life, and he has successfully approved what they are. Do you want to know what's essential for life? Well, come to this guy because he's tested it and approved it. How was he able to do that? Look at verse 18. Being instructed out of the law. Add the definite article there. Now, this might just be a reference to the Old Testament. He's been instructed out of the Bible, the Old Testament at that point. Might mean also the the first five books, the Pentateuch. But the point is, this Jewish hypocritical moralist has instructors who have been catechizing him with the law. He's weaponized. And closely connected to all of these is another if, verse 19. And if you are confident, if you're convinced of what? If you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, so relying on the law the way he does, where's he looking? Where's his confidence? To evaluate others. He's looking at the poor blind ones around him. He's weaponized. I've measured you and I have found you to be blind. You just can't see what you need. But I am confident of this, that I am the eyes that you don't have, that you must have. You're confident that you're a guide to the blind. What else does Paul say? If you are confident that you yourself, verse 19, are a light to those in darkness, where's he looking? He's looking outside of himself at the poor souls in moral darkness around him. I have evaluated you, he might say, concluded that you are in darkness when it comes to morality. But don't worry, I'm confident that I can be the light that you don't have but that you must have. What else does Paul say? Verse 20, if you're confident that you yourself are a corrector of the foolish... Or is he focused yet again as one who's weaponized with law? He's looking at others. What has he concluded about them? Oh, the poor ignorant one in the abyss. I, I've judged you to be a fool with the way that you've lived. But don't worry, I'm confident that I myself can bring correction to your life. One more. If you are confident that you are, verse 20, a teacher of the immature, where is he focused again? He's looked around and he's found some infantile ones around him, some immature ones, and he has concluded them to be morally infantile. But they don't need to worry because he is confident that he can be the teacher they need. Man, it makes you wonder, is there anybody this guy can't help? But do you see how judgmental he is of others? What are the conclusions he's come to about those around him? Is there anyone outside of him that he views in a favorable light? He only sees blind people, darkened people, fools, and immature people all around him. He's measured them. He's evaluated them. He's judged them all, and he finds them to be inferior to him. This is the commentary on what Paul first meant when he said, didn't you judge others? And do you notice what he thinks about himself? He believes he himself is the answer for every single one of them. You could be blind, you can be darkened, you could be foolish, you could be infantile, but don't worry, this one is your hope. He can reform you. Look what he's capable of. He's a guide. He's light. He's a corrector. He's a teacher. He can reform you. What qualifies him to be such a reformer of others? Verse 20, do you see how it ends? Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. Notice what Paul didn't say. He didn't say, having in the law, knowledge and truth. The emphasis is on the fact that he has an embodiment of knowledge 
and of the truth. The point is with this word embodiment, it means it's an outward sketch of it. It's, it's the outward outline of something. It's an outward resemblance of something. The, the point is what he has in law, in the law, is only a ghostly apparition or shape of knowledge and of truth. In reality, he's a vacuum of knowledge and truth, even though he possesses law. Remember, verses 17 to 20, this is the outward possession of law that is put forward through conditions that Paul is willing to grant him. And the best this guy has is he possesses law, but he's got a false a sense of assurance before the God of judgment. And now Paul will show that the outward possession of law is truly a false assurance because the outward possession of it made absolutely no inward impact on his life. Look at with me secondly, number two, the inward omission of law. There's the outward possession of law, but the real problem is there's this inward omission of law. And to show this, that it had no inward effect, Paul asks the man some leveling questions. The man's possession of law externally is questionable, and so he asks some questions. If you were all these things as a Jew who relied on law and you were instructed, catechized out of the law, but you focused solely on others with law, did you ever turn the law around towards yourself? Verse 21, you therefore, you who teach another, do you not teach yourself? It's questionable looking at you, Paul says. Isn't this basic axiom true across the board? I mean, you don't have to be a Jew to get this. The teacher needs to teach himself first. Perhaps like the religious leadership of Jesus' day, this man also really likes sitting in the seat and the chair of Moses. But is he not his own first pupil? What could the man answer? Verse 21, you who preach that one shall not steal, do you? Do you steal? Because it's questionable with what you're doing with law regarding yourself. You know what's interesting? In Jesus' day, the religious leadership of the temple were said by Jesus to have turned the temple into a robber's den, a den of thieves. The religious leaders of the day were thieves who stole from everybody through the temple taxes and offerings, even willing to take a widow's last coin from her. You who preach that one should not steal, do you? Verse 22, look with me. You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? By the way this man lived his life, it's questionable. He's asking the question. We know two things from Jesus on this, that the religious leadership, the Jewish hypocritical moralists, that they divorced their wives for the most minor of infractions. They were serial divorcers, and therefore serial remarriers. Get tired of one wife, just divorce her and get another one. But because their serial divorces were not According to biblical standards, their serial remarriages were serial adulteries. Maybe he has that in mind. But Jesus also warned of how lust in the heart was tantamount to what? Adultery. Whichever the case was for the hypocritical moralist, he never thought to take the law up and point it around to himself. Verse 22, look with me. You abhor idols. Do you rob temples? Now, you just, at that point, you might go, no, wait a minute, Paul, that just falls, you've, you're out of control, Paul, you, you've gone into hyperbole, you've gone into extremes, because, I mean, everybody knows that since the exile of the Jews, um, that basically cured them of their rampant idolatry that we read about over and over and over in the Old Testament. I mean, they truly do abhor idols by this time. So, so how is this a questionable practice of robbing a temple? You know, a temple would be where the idol is. Really? Is it plausible that a Jew would ever enter into a temple to rob an idol, maybe because there was an opportunity to make a profit off of it if they sold it? I don't know. Is it possible? 
Turn with me back to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19. In, in, in verses 23 to 41, this is Paul's third missionary journey, um, and a riot has broken out in Ephesus. And it was spearheaded by Demetrius, who was a Gentile and an idol maker. And his business was being impacted greatly on a negative way because of the preaching of the gospel. Many people were getting saved and getting rid of their idols. And the whole city is in an uproar. The whole city is out of control. Look at verse 30 with me. And when Paul wanted to go into that assembly, the disciples wouldn't let him. Also, some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. And so then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not even know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews put him forward. And having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. So do you have the scene? Gentile city, everybody's in the theater, it's an uproar, and it's caused by the Gentiles who are making uh, the idols, and they're upset because uh, their prophet is way down, and come step forward is, is this Jew. Verse 34, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, it didn't help. A single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours. This is better than any uh, soccer game going on. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, men of Ephesus, he was there representing Rome. We blow this here in this city. Uh, Rome will crush us. Men of this city, um, men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis? and of the image which fell down from heaven. So then these are undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. But watch this, verse 37. You've brought these men here who are neither what? Robbers of temples, nor blasphemers of our gods, our goddess. Evidently, it was plausible in his mind, this Gentile's mind, in all of their minds, in Asia Minor, that a Jew just might, what? Steal some idols. Why would he mention that if it had never, ever happened before? The point is what? It had happened before. Back to Romans 2. Have you, Paul's basically saying, have you gone to such hypo, hypocritical lengths that, that you, one who abhors idols that, that you would actually rob temples? What's Paul doing with this? Do you teach yourself? Do you steal? Do you, do you commit adultery? Do you rob temples? What's he doing? I mean, do you teach yourself? Doesn't everybody get that? But it was questionable whether the Jewish hypocritical moralist got it. Do you steal? None of us like it when somebody steals our stuff. We shouldn't do that. We all get it. But it was questionable whether the Jewish hypocritical moralist got it. Do you commit adultery? Doesn't just about every man hate it when his wife is violated by another? But it was questionable whether the Jewish hypocritical moralist got it. And same with robbing temples. Gentiles knew how bad that was. It really worked them up. They would throw riots together for such things. But it was questionable whether the Jewish hypocritical moralist even got that basic fact. Wait a minute. You name yourself a Jew, verse 17? The first thing on your mind is to rely on law, but it's questionable if you bring anything of law to bear on your own life, even in ways that Gentiles would get? Now, let's just full stop again for a moment here and, and remind ourselves of how actually not far away we are from a Jew in the first century, but how actually close we are. 
Let's not pretend that we're sitting far away in some safe place from this Jew. And, and that what he's displaying is something uniquely that is it's just Jewish DNA, first century stuff. And 20 centuries later, I mean, here we are, Western Christians. I mean, um, can't you see something of this in your own heart? The great sin in each one of us is a proneness to take God's word, weaponize ourselves with it, and turn it on each other. All while neglecting our own hearts. I think many times in my own life, this is one of the things I have to fight for against, fight against most in my parenting. Oh man, I'm ready to turn it on my kids. And I got some burdens for them to put on them. Haven't even thought about whether or not I've touched it lately. Do you look outside yourself? And when you do, what do you see in people around you? Do you see lowly creatures below you? You know, blind, darkened, foolish, infantile. Do you think more highly of you than you ought to? Like you're their hope? If they would only listen to you. I mean, you could guide them. You could be light for them. You can bring correction to their error. You can teach them. Why won't they reform their living with somebody like you in their life? See, this is a fallen human problem, not a foolish Jewish problem only. Look back at chapter 2, verse 23, Romans 2, verse 23, back to the Jewish hypocritical moralist. Paul comes back to this so-called Jew's reliance on the law that he first mentioned in verse 17, right? If you rely on the law, look what he says in verse 23, you who boast in law. That's what you're boasting in. That's what you're bragging on. That's what you're depending on. That's what you're relying on. This one made a big deal about adding law to his rebellious life, but because he's only a transgressor of the law, a breaker of the law, verse 23, what he's actually doing is dishonoring God. You who boast in law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? So whatever kind of boasting or bragging that was that was going on in verse 17 in God, it was actually only a bragging of the tongue and it was not a true worshipful boasting rooted in the heart of the man. Now the Jewish hypocritical moralist might say, well, how is it that I'm I'm dishonoring God? Well, the explanation is given. Verse 24. uh, Yeah, verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the nations, among the Gentiles. God's name is being slandered, discredited, blasphemed among the nations. How? Because of you, you hypocritical moralist, he says. The Jewish hypocritical moralist, he was so concerned about the name he gave himself. I name myself Jew. He was absolutely unconcerned with the only name that mattered, God's. He labored to establish his own reputation and name, but by living so recklessly with law, he gave pagans just cause for mocking God's name and reputation. And and that's a common truth among people that people reflect what their God is like by the way they live. All while this Jew claims to brag on God and turn the law against others and judge them to reform them, he's actually discrediting his God before the nations. Gentiles could look at this Jewish hypocritical moralist's life and say, what a deity this man's God must be. 
And again, that's not exclusively a Jewish problem. For Christians, if our community, our city we live in, if the nation we live in has a difficult time taking Jesus seriously, the first place we might need to look is in our own house to see if the way that we've been living truly honors Jesus or not. We need to be concerned above all for God's reputation, for Christ's name. Not whether our name is in lights or not. So by the end of verse 24, Paul has eradicated this Jewish hypocritical, moralist, false assurance, which was mere outward possession of a law, And it's eradicated as a false assurance because it made absolutely no inward impact on him. And it proved God was only dishonored by the way he lived his life. And God was slandered because of him. Maybe a couple things for us to think about. Can I start with you, believer, and me? for believers in Jesus Christ. So how are you doing with God's word these days? And and what are you doing with God's word these days? If you're not careful and you're not alert, you'll find like in, I find in my life, that one of the first things that can happen is you just begin to weaponize yourself with God's word and point it at others around you. It's easy to do with God's word what the Jewish hypocritical moralist did with law. And without thinking and not being careful with your own heart, not shepherding your heart well, um, just naturally what you'll find as you'll look at other people around you is, is you'll, you'll find yourself being bugged by who they are and what they are. There's blind people around you, people who can't see because they're in darkness, they're foolishness everywhere around me. Those are judgment conclusions we make. And we can, without even trying, without even thinking, without watching ourselves carefully, we can begin to feel very morally superior to them. Jesus' parable on this is we're bugged by the speck that's in our brother's eye, but we can't see there's a beam a log sticking out of our own eye. And listen, that's not God's word's fault. God's word doesn't make us be that way. We do that. And not because we're Jews, but because we're fallen humans who do that. Are you turning the word around and toward yourself first? so that you can remove the log that you couldn't even see. Oh, blind guide, what was I thinking? How did that get there? You're knocking people out in your home. Are you looking around at yourself first with the word of God so that you can remove it? You know what happens when you do? As soon as you take care of the big problem that's in your own life and you go back to that neighbor that you were so concerned about, you go, wow. It's not quite a big a problem in your life as I thought. It's just a, little, just a speck. It, you'll begin to see things proportionally. You'll, give it, you'll be able to finally give it its proper weight because you gave what was going on in your own life its proper weight. And then you'll really know how to compassionately and tenderly come to them. If they've got a speck in their eye, they don't need your chainsaw. But what if this morning, what, what, if, what if you truly are blind spiritually? What if you truly are blind to the things that God demands you must see? I mean, you must see his holiness. You must see his glory. You must see your sinfulness before him. What if you're blind and you truly haven't even seen those kinds of things before? What if you truly are 
in darkness, that you can't see your own way out of your own sinful darkness that you've made and captivated yourself in? What if you truly are living a very foolish life for yourself? And what if you truly are infant-like, baby-like, in the sense that you can't discern what immorality angers God and what morality pleases Him? There's something to learn from this passage for you. Your solution is not to merely add law to your rebellious life, to your blindness, to your foolishness, to your darkness, to your immaturity. Because what you'll find out in doing so is you'll become just like this guy. You'll be weaponized and you'll take it and you'll turn it on others. And you'll only be foolishly laying up heavy demands on others without even thinking to touch it for yourself. And you'll only be storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, Romans 2.5. You see, adding law to your life in that condition will only give you a false assurance, and it's a false assurance. Your only true assurance, your only true solution is a person, Jesus Christ. He calls you to turn away from your blindness, your darkness, your foolishness, your immaturity, and your sin, and to turn to him and to trust in him alone. His call to you even right now is to believe him. Believe that the only thing that can turn away God's righteous anger from you is his death at the cross in your place. That's what he's calling you to right now. And his promise is that he will in no way cast you out. All who believe him, he gladly forgives. And he gives himself freely to them. He's what you need. Your problem is you have a Jesus-less life. And you must have him. Come to him even now by faith alone to be saved by him alone. You pray with me. Father in heaven, how sobering these words are for us when we are thinking rightly. What is this disease in us that makes it so easy for us to look away from ourselves to others, to draw critical conclusions about them and then feel really good about ourselves being the, ref the reformers they need all while missing our own lives. Father, would you draw near to us? Help us to see the hideousness of that again yet today that we might turn from it. Remind us of how beautiful and appealing Jesus, our teacher, is. He was never this way. Lord, may we flee to him this morning once again, yet again as a church. Though we often go astray and lose sight of the place we must be, you never fail to bring us back, Lord. Even do this now for those it's needed in, Lord, and for those who need to trust your son for the very first time, Lord, grant it, please, in your mercy, in your kindness, in your tolerance, in your patience, Lord. Let them see their need for repentance. Give it to them today. We ask it in Christ's name, amen.